Hi, it's George Whittem reporting for Whittem's World. Uh, I'm going to do a short answer episode this week and do a little bit of catching up. So first of all, let's start off here with a question from Linda Scott. Linda says, regarding professional disdain for USB mics, what is your opinion on the Yeti Blue? Why would this mic be considered subpar? Well, I've been told I can get away with it because it has surprisingly nice sound. I'm worried about the dreaded room noise. However, I'm considering the Chaotica Eyeball. I'm waiting to hear back from the customer support getting it to work with the Yeti. So the Yeti actually, I would agree, has surprisingly good sound. But the problem with the Yeti is really not its sound quality, it's really more of its design. It's very susceptible to popping. It's a very awkward shape because it's so large. It's very difficult to get it in a position that works really well for reading with a copy stand. Um, it's bulky and very heavy, so when you're putting it on a mic arm of any kind, you have to have a pretty heavy-duty stand to hold the weight of it. It, it, it just was never really designed to be used off of its normal uh, little tripod, not tripod, but its little R2-D2 looking legs that it sits on. Um, and then it, because it's so big, it's not going to fit into something like the Chaotica eyeball very easily. And you can see how small that opening is. There's no way that the, the uh, Yeti, look at that, how big that mic is, uh, is going to fit in there. So, you know, it, it's not really not a very practical USB mic. But what I really find to be a great USB mic because of its quality and its ease of use sound and it just designed and work like a real voiceover mic should is the Shure PG42 USB. So that's the one I can wholeheartedly recommend. Carrie Hampton asks, my question is probably typical for newbies to the voiceover industry like me. I've got my new studio equipment set up and I'm happy with it. However, I'm currently using Audacity on my two-year-old Toshiba laptop. My goal is to eventually purchase an Apple computer and use Twisted Wave as you recommended. You did say that Audacity was all right, and I am comfortable with it, but in the interim, would it be worth my while to purchase a software program that might be a little bit more user-friendly than Audacity? I don't think Audacity is not user-friendly. I think it is pretty user-friendly, actually. It has a few quirks, and once you learn to work with those quirks, like such as the way it works with multi-track, and every time you stop and start a recording, it makes a new track, it's really not all that bad. Um, the problem really with Audacity, I think it's just the audio processing tools are just not the greatest. And um, I think when you really find out that you have to start doing some audio processing, Audacity is going to start feeling very restrictive. You can record great audio quality with either software, I don't think you should invest or buy or use anything different on the PC uh, if you're inevitably going to be getting a Mac. And if you're starting to get actual jobs where you're feeling like Audacity might be getting in the way, we can talk, find a better solution. This one came in from Kim Bjorklund. Like a lot of voice actors, I tend to have strong S sounds or sibilants. While I and many voice coaches are working to correct this at the source, I wondered if there is any particular microphone that might help. I currently use an AT2035 with a Scarlett II i2, a wooden voice booth with some sound damping treatment, soundboard and moving blankets, which sits in the outbuilding in my yard. Sibilance is something that has to be corrected from the mouth for the most part. And any good studio microphone that is very sensitive and over the entire voice range is going to be sensitive to whatever comes out of your mouth. So if you have strong S's that are very sibilant, the microphone's going to hear it. Now, there are some mics that tend to be a little bit smoother at the top end and aren't quite as bright sounding, and they can sometimes be a little bit more forgiving, such as the uh, Shure SM7B, which is a dynamic mic. Um, but it causes its own problems because it's not very sensitive. So getting good noise floor or low noise floor recordings with that mic is quite challenging. Um, I think more helpful would be to actually use the microphone position a little bit differently. Um, for example, this is this is a mic shaped like the 2035 a little bit. Instead of speaking to the mic straight or having the microphone pointing straight at your mouth, rotate the capsule of the microphone so that you're speaking to more of the side of the microphone. Not 90 degrees, but about 45. And what that does is the pickup pattern changes and the response then changes. And what happens is as you get more to the side of the mic, 
or what we call off axis, the mic starts to get less sensitive to treble frequency. So that's another way you can try dialing out, literally like turning a knob, twist the mic, and you'd be surprised how well that can work to reduce sibilance. Here's one from a, a regular fan of ours, Scott McDonald. His question basically is what makes a good room? Is it more than just having a dead space? How about diffusers? Are they helpful? Should there be some life in the room as well? Well, a good room for a voiceover recording, you know, for picking up a voice in a very uh, neutral way, generally has almost no reflection or life in the room at all. So you don't want to have anything reflective anywhere near the microphone. And if you're working in a small space, like a voiceover booth or a closet that's you know, six by eight or something like that, or even smaller, you don't want anything reflective in that room to cause any more liveliness. Diffusion rarely works in very small spaces. As the room gets larger, it's, that changes quite a bit. The room I'm in here is a mishmash of different stuff. The whole wall behind me is acoustical absorption, but on either side of me, we've got windows, we have a ceiling on a slope, we have a bookshelf covered with books. All that stuff is acting as diffusion, and it does give the room a little bit of liveliness. Uh, but the rule of thumb is something called RT60, and that's the time it takes for a sound, an impulse, such as a finger snap or something like that, that's the time it takes for the decay or the sound of that sound to dissipate by 60 decibels. A good voiceover booth is going to have an RT60 time of 0.1 second. That's very, very short. So you don't want too much liveliness. And if you do, it's going to make it harder for an engineer to create the environment that they want your voice to sound like it, it exists in. It's very hard to remove uh, ambience or echo that's there or any kind of reverberation that's already there. It's a lot easier to add it in. So that's why you really don't want to have much liveliness in a room. A good room should be pretty darn dead and have very little acoustical reflectivity. Um, but it doesn't have to be tiny. My room is 10 by 10 with a nice high ceiling. And because the ceiling is on a slope and this room sounds really nice. So a good room will make the microphone or any microphone, uh, even the cheapest microphones, sound pretty darn good. This one's sort of a follow-up to the review I did of the Audient ID22. Uh, this person says, who is this? Jeff LaPensi. Could be Jeff LaPensi. Maybe I'm overthinking it. I have a Summit Audio 2BA221 mic preamp going into an Echo Audio Gina 3G into my computer. I was thinking about buying the Audient and then selling my Summit Audio to help recoup the cost. Do you believe the pre's are good enough on the Audient to use that and that only? I know I'd be losing some tube, but I don't really use it that much. I was told if I want to be warm or thick in the read, I can just do that in post. I totally agree. Absolutely. Um, the Audient microphone preamps are world class, really, really clean, low noise. They're fantastic. So I don't think you can go wrong at all just using the preamps built into the Audient. So, you know, go for it. But in the end, you got to use your ear. So record with your chain using the old setup and record with the Audient using the new setup and do an A B comparison and make sure you're happy with the results. I'm not a big fan of tubes for home studios. I've talked about it many times before. Maintenance issues, heat issues, uh, the sound changes over time, all these things. But uh, go with what sounds best at the end of the day. You may end up using it alongside the audience. You never know. Oh, and I almost forgot. It's Movember. So if you'll notice, if you looked really, really closely, I have a little bit of a mustache growing. I'm growing it for the Movos team where a bunch of voice actor or voice in industry related folks who want to uh, help raise money for men's health and help men's health research such as prostate cancer. So I'll put a link down below. If you're interested in helping out our team and making a small donation, we'd really appreciate it. We'll all keep growing our mustaches for you and posting them online so you can laugh at us with our horrible mustaches. <laughs> I'm not a good mustache grower. So I wanted to get caught up a little bit. I hope I, we got through, well, we did get through quite a few questions today. So I'm psyched about that. And if you want your question answered, just send it into widomsworld at edgestudio.com. 
And if you want tech support, you can still find all that information at vostudiotech.com or give us a call, 212-868-EDGE to point you in the right direction. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate it. I'll see you next week. And this is George Whittem reporting for Whittem's World. Cheers. Cheers.